Hey guys. So I want everybody to start by thinking of their favorite viral video. So shout a few out. Very good. There's, there's tons of them. So I think back to some of my favorites, The Bed Intruder, Charlie Bit My Finger, uh, Don't Taze Me Bro. Um, but when I think back, the one that was most memorable for me is over 20 years ago. This was back in the early 90s. And this was the first viral video. Some of you may not even remember it. Um, this was The Dancing Baby. So, Allie McBeal, very good. So this was the early 90s, 94, 95. I was in middle school at the time, and this was before Google, before YouTube. Um, this was the days of Yahoo, uh, Prodigy, CompuServe. Right? I was in sixth grade at the time, so it's still old enough to remember. And you couldn't just go to YouTube and find, type in some keywords and get a good laugh, right? The only way to get a copy of this goofy, strange, right, which was really impressive at the time, um, <laughs> was to go into some obscure chat room or obscure message board and find it. Um, and no doubt I was a, a computer nerd at the time, and I got really excited when I, I got my hands on a copy of The Dancing Baby. And there were, there were three different versions of this video, and I got all three. So I made a GeoCities website and posted all three versions of The Dancing Baby on the site. And the next day, I had the first listing on Yahoo. So I was getting 10,000 hits a day in 1995 onto this site. If you typed in Dancing Baby, you, you went to my site. And I was 11, 12 years old at the time and didn't really, <laughs> didn't really know what to do with that. Um, right? The internet was still really even kind of new, dial-up modems. Um, and I remember a few days after this, I came home from school, went down for dinner and sat with my parents and said, hey, mom and dad, I made this thing called a website and I posted this video of this strange, awkward, weird dancing baby and 10,000 people a day are looking at it. My dad's first was, reaction was, well, you should try selling something. <laughs> I, I go, okay, great idea. So I went upstairs after dinner and posted on the top of the website, dancing baby t-shirts for sale. And I'm not kidding, within minutes, people were sending me their credit cards. There was no shopping carts or anything back then. They were literally just like emailing, uh, emailing their credit cards. <laughs> so, so I was screwed. I didn't have Dancing Baby t-shirts to, to send to them. So to make a long story short, from the time I was in sixth grade to my junior year of high school, I ran a company called Crash Designs. And this was the mid-90s pop culture. So we were selling t-shirts, hats, coffee mugs for things like the Spice Girls, Backstreet Boys, um, the movie Titanic, that was a really hot seller, Seinfeld. Um, and it was incredible, right? I was, um, I was advertising in Entertainment Weekly, 17, us, people. My dad was sneaking me out of school when I was in seventh grade. We flew to Vegas, we flew to New York to go and represent my company. <laughs> Um, it was amazing. I hired one of my friends. We would ride the bus home from school and hop over a fence and go into my office building. <laughs> it, it was wild, right? And there was nothing sexy or cool about this, right? I can't think of anything much nerdier than selling dancing baby t-shirts. Um, but it worked. I saw an opportunity and I went for it and it was incredible. But I'm not here to talk about um, what was clearly a very cool experience from my childhood. I'm here to talk about finding opportunities in the simple things. There's three key points I really hope to get across in the short time that I talk with you. First and foremost, take the non-traditional path. When Dooley introduced me, he mentioned that I'm a doctor. It's true, I'm a pediatrician. You can imagine that when I told my neurotic Jewish mother that I wasn't gonna go and be and practice medicine, but instead it was gonna go and run a software company, she nearly lost it. Second is sleep when you're dead. Everybody always says that there's not enough hours in the day, there's not enough time. But I created a second company during some of the busiest times of my life. During the seven years of medical school and residency, I found another opportunity, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. I was working 80 hours a week in the hospital. I was sleeping three hours a night for a period of three years. That's not an exaggeration but I saw something that I was really passionate about and couldn't let it go. Third, and probably most importantly, 
is to surround yourself with passionate people. This was something that I learned very early on and something that was so important. If you surround yourself with passionate people who motivate you, they're going to propel you further and motivate you further. So back to my story. I sold my business when I was, sold Crash Designs and The Dancing Baby um, when I was a junior in high school. And fast forward just a few years later, only two years later, during a summer, um, I was now in college and went to the University of Michigan. And was always a summer camp guy. Always wanted to be outside, do things outdoors, but also wanted to practice medicine. And a good family friend of ours who was a local pediatrician invited me to come um, shadow her at a local summer camp that's about an hour and a half north of here. It was the perfect opportunity. I could be at camp and I could you know, get some experience in my resume um, as I applied to medical school. So I went to this camp. There were a healthy, regular camp. It wasn't a special needs camp, it wasn't a medical camp. And saw what a nightmare it was managing all of the health information. Right? There were about a thousand kids that went to this camp, and over half of them were on some sort of medication. Right? This camp was distributing hundreds of medications every day. ADHD meds, allergy meds, asthma meds, anxiety meds, you name it. Mistakes were being made all the time, and nobody wanted to admit it. Right? This, staff had a, the, this camp had a pretty good um, medical staff as well. Two doctors and three nurses on staff, 24 hours a day. I came on in, I was in uh, you know, early 20s, and came on and said, what the heck's going on here, guys? Little Timmy was getting little Susie's medication by mistake. Little Sarah was getting her sleeping pills at breakfast. <laughs> there, was, uh, there was a time that I recall that mom dropped her daughter off at camp with a Ziploc bag full of purple pills, and on a yellow sticky note, hand wrote, give Sarah two purple pills at lunch. That was it. So I questioned that and said, that doesn't seem right. Let's look at her medical, her health form. So we pulled out her, went to the filing cabinet, pulled out her health form. No reference to any purple pills, no reference to any medical condition. What's going on? So we called mom up and she said, oh yeah, those are, those are Sarah's antipsychotic medications. Right? So something had to be done. Right? There was, this was an accident waiting to happen. It's amazing that some, nothing bad had happened previously. So I, right, I was late teenager, early 20s, and I had approached and looked at these professional doctors and nurses and said, there's got to be a better way to do this. I saw another opportunity. Really just to make these kids a whole lot safer, make my job a whole lot easier when I went up to volunteer there every summer, and approached the camp director and said, if you're willing to buy a few laptops for the camp clinic, I'll build you some software to make everybody's jobs a whole lot easier and reduce the risk. They agreed. And I spent the first, part, first few years in college building the prototype software. Near the end of college, um, had it ready, and we tested it out. It worked really well. There were bugs, things we couldn't prove, but right, there was, this, this was going to work. So I said to myself, well, if it works here, why wouldn't it work at any other camp? Right again, there, there was nothing sexy, cool about this. The concept of electronic medical records already existed. Right? This was the time, about 10 years ago, when every doctor's office, every hospital was adopting electronic medical records. So this was nothing new. But I saw a need. Right? These industries that weren't inherently medical, but still required medical information, there was nothing out there for them. So now I was, I was at a crossroads. Right? I was planning to go to medical school, go down this path, and loved it. But now I had this opportunity and couldn't let it go. But I wanted to do both. I couldn't give either up. I loved medicine. I wanted to be a pediatrician. But I loved the technology. I saw this thing that I was becoming very passionate about, something that I built that was being used by, these camp, by this camp, and saw what a difference it made. So I said, said to myself, I'm, I'm going to do both. So the first few, few years of medical school, I rewrote all the software, rebuilt it so that it could be scalable to other camps. And just started sending emails to other camps in the area. It worked. These people loved it. They were, they were willing to pay me for it, which was, was amazing. But I was doing all this, right, for four years of medical school, three years of pediatric residency, working 80 hours a week. Many months, for those that, that don't know how the, the medical training works, there's many months where you only get four days off in an entire month. Right? You work six days a week, 80 hours a week. So this is not an exaggeration, although most people think it is. I was sleeping four hours a night for three years straight to get this going. 
I would wake up at five in the morning to be at the hospital at six, would work a 12-hour shift at the hospital, got home by 6.30, ate, ate a quick dinner, and then from eight o'clock till two in the morning, worked on the software, worked on the company. It was incredible. It was working. But I knew it wasn't sustainable. Right? There was an instance I remember. Um, I was working, doing a rotation in the ICU, in the intensive care unit, working a 30-hour call. I was in the hospital for 30 hours. And there was this opportunity to go to California to market and sell the product. I was the only one that could do it. So I left the hospital at 6 in the morning in my scrubs, drove straight to the airport, flew to San Diego, marketed the product, Within less than 10 hours, flew back, had to be, be at the hospital for another shift. It, this wasn't easy. It was exhausting. And I knew it wasn't sustainable, right? I, I had to, I, ha I needed help. Um, I, I couldn't continue to just do it all on my own. I'm sure there's lots of you out here that are entrepreneurs and know that in the beginning, you are customer service, you are tech support, you are sales, you are marketing, you do it all. But it's not, it's not sustainable. So in the beginning, I just needed the help, any help I could get. I didn't really care. Family, friends, random interns I could find, whatever I, whatever I could get, I, I took. And it worked. It worked in the beginning. Um, but there was an instance, um, probably the second or third summer that the software was being used on a larger scale, where it crashed. We couldn't handle the growth. Right? We now had, instead of just a few dozen camps, we had near 100 camps. There were too many users in the system for it to, to uh, work, work functionally. Forgetting to do my slides. <laughs> uh, that, that's me at camp with my long hair. This was, the, this was the set I took over to San Diego. This was our first office. So, so the software wasn't working great, right? And as a doctor, I was always taught, first do no harm. It was right around now, the middle of June. Camps were getting very anxious. The software wasn't working the way it was supposed to. I was getting phone calls, I was getting emails, I was losing sleep. What the heck was going to happen? You know, what made me most nervous is, God forbid, the 30 seconds that the app crashed in the middle of July was the same 30 seconds that little Timmy had an anaphylactic reaction to peanuts, and the camp couldn't access his electronic medical records, right? Something catastrophic truly could have happened. So this was great. I mean, I, I, was, I built this amazing product. It, would, it was working, but I was watching it start to crumble before my eyes, and I didn't know what to do. It wasn't an easy decision, but I just decided to shut it down. Right? This thing was bigger than me. It was more important than my reputation in the local community. It was more important than my reputation in the camp community. It was more important than the reputation of the, the business, the, the company that I was starting. The health and safety of these kids is what it was all about. So I remember I stayed up till three in the morning on my cell phone and I called every one of my camps personally. I had to let them know that I was letting them down. The software that I sold them, that I promised them, the soft, same software that they maybe even used the summer before, wasn't gonna work. They were gonna have to go back to pen and paper. As you can imagine, I, I heard some pretty choice words. People were not too happy. Um, some threatened to sue. Um, I even remember one morning or night, I, I had to drive to Kinko's in the middle of the night and printed out, I'm not kidding, almost 40,000 pages of medical records because the camp was starting the next day. And they needed the records, right? So I had no choice. But throughout all of this, I knew I couldn't ever give up, right? I was so passionate. I saw that there was a need. I saw that people wanted this. And I couldn't let it go. And in the middle of while all of this was happening, and I was trying to reevaluate, some of the key people that were working with me left. They, couldn't, they couldn't, couldn't handle the tough times. They couldn't stay through thick and thin. They were out. So from that point forward, I made it, it became so important to me to make sure that anybody else that helped me was passionate beyond belief. Right? They had to believe in what I was doing. They had to be willing to stick there, stick it out through thick and thin. Um, it was so important. So we worked, it wasn't easy to take it all down, but we eventually that summer was able to bring it back up. We recovered and salvaged a few of the relationships, a few which are still current customers, and we rebuilt it. I was still, now this was the end of my residency, I was still working 80 hours a week in the hospital. But I knew I needed the key people. So I found and brought on a few key people that worked off of my kitchen table in my condo, 
some of which I never even saw. I was working from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. They had keys. I had just met them, gave them keys to my condo, and they sat at my kitchen table and, and worked this thing. We did that for about a year, and it was growing. We figured out, learned from our mistakes, and moved into an office. We were there for a few years. We outgrew that space, moved into another office. It's been an amazing experience. And to fast forward even further, right, so where we are now, we currently work with over 1,000 camps and schools all over the country. Girl Scouts, YMCAs, JCCs, Boy Scouts, Parks and Rec Departments, major colleges and universities. We have a team of over 25 amazing people um, that work on this every day. And one of the things that when we bring on new people, because like lots of startups, we're always hiring and always looking for new people, and I always kind of categorize when we're interviewing people, put them into kind of three categories. Some of my team members are back there and have heard me give this spiel before. But we, uh, there's the good team member, right? That's the person who they are an extremely hard worker. They show up on time. They're not screwing around on Facebook, texting all day. They're getting their job done. They're dedicated. They love what they do. Those people are good. We need them. Then there's the great team member. Right? That's the person who does everything I just said, but on occasion they're forward thinking and they'll come to me and say, hey Michael, I have this great idea, what do you think? It's great, right? Those are the people that help propel us forward. Then there's the rock star. Right? Those are the people that they are hardworking, they're dedicated, they're putting their all into this, but they don't just say, hey Michael, I had this idea. They'll come to me and say, hey Michael, I had this idea, I already tested it out, it's working, can I run with it further? Right? Those are the rock stars. Those are the people that keep me motivated, make the product that I originally designed even better, even greater, and help take this thing to the next level. So that's kind of the story. Um, coming back to the kind of original three points um, and three kind of key things I really hope you, you get out of this. Take the non-traditional path. Right? Challenge yourself. It would have been so easy for me to just go and go to medical school, be a doctor, live a comfortable, you know, earn a comfortable living. But I saw something I was really passionate about and had to try it. I couldn't stop. Right? It, it wasn't easy, but I did it. I believed in it. Second, again, sleep when you're dead. You know, again, if it's something you are passionate about, there's no reason you can't do it. If I could do all of this during the, you know, working 80 hours a week, sleeping three hours a night for three years straight, and if there's something you really believe in, there's no doubt that you can do it too. And third, and again, most importantly, is surround yourself with those passionate people. It's so important. Um, it's what keeps me motivated every day. It's, it's what makes this product even better. So thank you all. I keep forgetting my slides because I'm so excited. This is some of, my, some of the current team. So again, thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to me today. I wish you all the best of luck in whatever you're passionate about. And thank you again.